catch my breath. Oh. <laughs> Hi, everyone here tonight. Welcome to Vision Church of Lockhart, everyone that's watching this online. We're so happy that you're with us here tonight and excited for this lesson. We're on chapter 15. And so we just sat 15 and 16, and we're going to start 15 tonight. So welcome, and let's pray and get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day, Father, that you've made. Father, that we could come together and just rest in your presence, Father, and, and learn about you, learn your word, Father. So I pray, Father, that you would prepare our hearts, prepare our eyes, our ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to each one of us. We thank you for your word, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So chapter 15, verse 1. Again, this is in King James. And if you want to follow in your own um, in your own translation, I know y'all have easier translations to follow. But in verse 1, 15, chapter 15, verse 1, it says, When then, when then that are strong, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. This verse is the summary of Paul's teaching in chapter 14. He explained that the Christian who is strong in grace is technically correct, realizing that it's all right to eat meat sacrificed to idols, but just because it's lawful doesn't mean that it is correct thing to do. He clearly states that the strong believer is supported, is supposed to bear the infirmities of his or her weak Christian brother or sister. Remember um, last week, it was saying that it was meat that was sacrificed to idols. And once they sacrificed that meat, that meat went to like the market, you would say like to the grocery store, to their meat market, and it was sold and people would buy that and, and as meat. And so some of the Christians, the Jewish Christians, um, refused to eat the meat because they knew they couldn't tell which one was sacrificed to an idol, so they just did away with it. And Christians, Gentiles, then they, there's nothing wrong with it because they would pray for their food and then bless it and it's all good. So it was saying, you know, if you're with a weak brother in that area, don't do it, you know, just to for him, for their sake. And that's what is continuing to say here. The word bear was translated from the Greek word bastaso, meaning to left. This gets a picture of a Christian with a weak conscience being burdened down with guilt or condemnation. We that are strong are supposed to help him or her lift the load. We do that by not offending his or her weak conscience. The word that was translated infirmity here in, in this, the Greek word asthenonma, which means a scruple of conscience. This is saying that the stronger brother and sister need to help lift the burden of the brother or sister that is weak in conscience. Paul is summing up his instructions given in chapter 14 on how to get along with a brother or sister who has different convictions than you. It all comes back to love. Love thinks of the other person first. Love is not selfish. If we could seek the pleasure of others more than our own pleasure, we would kill strife. Only by pride comes contention. And you have the scriptures there that back up what is being said here. In verse 2 and 3, it says, Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. As always, Jesus is the supreme example of God's kind of love. Jesus submitted the things that he didn't have to as God. However, he became a man submitted himself lest he should offend people. If Jesus did this for us, how can any of us justify not bearing the infirmities of our 
our wheat brother or sister. I'm not sure if this scripture here is the one, and Matthew is the one that, where Jesus tells, um, where he's asked if he pays taxes, and he tells, I think it's Peter with him, or one of the disciples to go and fish, and he would find a coin there. So he didn't want to offend, he didn't have to pay taxes. He's the owner of everything, right? But he didn't want to offend the, the people that were asking, so he wanted to do the same, so he wouldn't offend the weaker uh, verse 15 says, For whose, whatsoever thing were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Okay, through patience and comfort of the scriptures. Patience and comfort comes through the scriptures. Amen. All the Old Testament scriptures were written for our instruction so that we would not make the same mistakes. A person who does not heed the lessons of the Old Testament is like a person who is trying to reinvent the wheel. People have already made mistakes, and the Old Testament scriptures were faithful to report the consequences of those sins. We don't have to learn the same lessons by hard knocks. We can learn at their expense instead of ours. Patience, comfort, and hope do not come to us by begging and pleading with God. You cannot have a lasting measure of these things by having someone just lay hands on you. They come through the scriptures. A misunderstanding of scriptures like Romans 5.3 and James 1.3 have caused some people to mistakenly think that problems produce patience. Okay, Romans 5.3 says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And James 1.3 says, Knowing that testing of your faith produces patience. Okay, and it's not, um, it's not saying that the problems that come your way is what produces patience. The, the word does. And so when you have a... Uh, when you have a problem, your patience is just, you're just exercising your patience, so to speak. Amen. However, this verse makes it clear that patience is a product of the scriptures. If tribulations produce patience, then every Christian would be patient. And you know that's not true. <laughs> we have all had tribulation. Patience comes through God's word, but problems cause us to exercise or use our patience and therefore become stronger. Amen. And never pray for patience because you will get tested. <laughs> My husband used to do that to me all the time. Pray for patience. And I said, and then, I mean, I would get tried. I said, I think I got it. <laughs> now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Paul is referring back to verse 3 where he used Christ as an example of bearing the infirmities of those who are weak. He is praying that the Lord would work this same grace in us that was displayed in Christ Jesus. Six, verse 6 and 7 says that ye may want that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us by the glory of God. How do we determine what doctrines are negotiable and which ones are not? If an individual has been truly born again by Christ receiving him or her, then we should receive that person also, regardless of our differences. If Jesus is able to overlook the doctrinal errors of an individual, who are we to refuse that person? This all comes back to unity. I think the Lord, you know, is going to tarry to come until we all get into unity. You know, there's so many religious and so many different thinkings. And, and, but I think the Lord, like it says, and I believe it's um, in John 17, that he prays that we would all be in, in unity. And I, I believe the Lord is waiting for all of us to come to unity and that to know that if we're Christians and we have accepted the Lord, 
we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not of this religion or that religion or, you know, we have different uh, doctrinal issues or things that we believe. But if it doesn't have to do if it, with salvation, you know, if we're all saved and we're all children of God and we should get along. It doesn't matter what our traditions are as long as it's not making the word of no effect, you know, on how you worship or how you do. Like some religions, you know, the women have to wear long skirts and a hair in a bun or however, no makeup or this or that. And, and some religions have a hard time with women being ministers. And that's, that's a doctrinal issue, I think, because it's in the Word of God, or they don't really know. They haven't read the Word of God. There's a lot of women preachers and uh, evangelists. And so those, those kind of things, things that we shouldn't argue over, but that we all look into Jesus and we all want to serve and, and reach other people for Christ. Amen? Verse 5, now the God of patience, no, I went back up. So we need to all be in unity. Verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promise made unto the fathers. Paul concluded his remarks about walking in love towards brethren who had different convictions. He, just, uh, he judged that on certain issues that were not critical to salvation, the stronger should bear the weak with the weak. Now lest someone should try to cite Jesus' exclusion of the Gentiles during his earthly ministry as proof that we can reject those who don't conform to Jewish traditions. Paul explains why Jesus ministered nearly exclusively to the Jews. He was fulfilling God's promises to the Jews. Jesus could not become the savior of the Gentile until he had been the Messiah to the Jews. Paul then goes on to cite a number of Old Testament scriptures that make it clear that Jesus' present ministry embraces the Gentiles without converting them to Judaism. And verse 9 says, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. And here he starts uh, referring to Old Testament scripture. It says, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and, and sing unto thy name. Paul briefly verifies the point that he has already made in this book to the Romans. He quotes four Old Testament scriptures to verify that Christ opened up the door of salvation to the Gentiles. This is done to make it clear that Gentiles do not have to become Jews to be saved. Salvation to Gentiles as Gentiles does not fall into the category of one of those non-essential doctrines that Paul discussed in chapter 14, on which we compromise for the sake of our weak brother or sister. I mean, we don't have to be trying to act like Jews or that we're Jews to be saved. You know, I, I know some people try to say that they're Jewish but when they're not. <laughs> but the word of God says that we are the true Jews, the ones that accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen. Here's another in verse 10 and 16 through 16. Here's some more Old Testament scripture. It says, and again, he said, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And ag again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. And loud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Okay, those are old, old Testament scriptures. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind because of the grace that was given to me of God, that I should be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, 
ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Church, we need the Holy Ghost to live a Christian life. You know, it's a lot of people um, try to live a Christian life in their own in their own in their own flesh, I should say, or you know, like I was, I was trying to to be good and trying to serve, and and I had I had never been taught about the Holy Ghost, so I felt that there some things, but but nobody ever taught. It wasn't something that was taught. It was that doctrine that was left out growing up. I saw it in my grandma a lot of times, but I, we weren't taught. We were taught to be afraid of it, and that it was of the devil, which is wrong. And, um, and so it makes it difficult to try to live a Christian life when you're living it in your flesh or when you don't know the grace of God. Amen. So we need that power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us so we can, you know, live that Christian life. And I think that's why a lot of, like it's saying here, to be strong and be, you know, be a good example to those that are weaker. And I think sometimes the weaker people leave the church because they see bad things that the, the ones that are supposed to be mature are doing and it offends them or, you know, it gives them a bad taste for for Christ or bringing, instead of bringing them to the Lord, we're running them off by what we're doing and saying. And so we need to be ever mindful and, and walk in the spirit every day. Like it said, to to be a living sacrifice. Every day is being a living sacrifice, just surrendering to the Holy Spirit and allow him to lead you. Amen. We cannot just worship God however we want to. Our worship has to be sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Until a person makes Jesus his Lord and the Holy Spirit does not intercede for him, Paul is saying that though his preaching is of the gospel and the Gentiles' reception of salvation, then the Holy Spirit was free to work on their behalf. In verse 17, it says, I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ and those th things which pertain to God. Paul brought the gospel to the Gentiles, which granted salvation to those who received it. Therefore, he had quite a bit to boast about. However, he said his boasting was through Christ Jesus, which clarifies that this was not done in arrogance or, or pride. It might not, it might sound like arrogance or pride, but he was saying it was, it was a given, right? And he was a little hard and, and stronger with the Romans, with this letter he's saying. And sometimes the word of God is, we need to be firm and and bold with the word of God because it's the word of God that's going to save and we can't be watering the word of God down just so we won't offend someone and not that we want to offend them but we want them to if, if it's offended or if it's stepping on your toes and there's something in our life that we need to to clear up or to look at I know when Pastor Kyle was preaching a lot of times I'd be sitting back there and I'd be going ouch <laughs> Ouch, because, you know, there's something that's going to touch you. And you said, that's a little area that you need to work on, you know. And so it's good to be bold. Um, verse 18 and 19. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about into Illyricum, <laughs> I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Paul was known primarily for his preaching of the gospel of God's grace, but Paul had the miraculous power of God working in him too. Indeed, this should be true of all ministers of the gospel. Paul struck you, 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 Ilimas, the sorcerer, with blindness causing the conversion of Sirius Paulus in Acts chapter 13. In Lystra, Paul healed a man who had been crippled at birth. I think all these you can find in Acts. In Philippi, Paul cast a spirit of divination out of a girl. 
And he was also delivered from prison in that city by a miraculous earthquake. In Ephesus, the Lord accomplished many special miracles through Paul by healing and delivering people as they came in contact with handkerchiefs or aprons that Paul had touched. In Troas, Paul raised Eutychus, Eutychus from the dead. And while shipwrecked on the island of Melita, Paul miraculous, miraculously survived a bite from a poisonous snake. Paul was also delivered from death at the hands of the Romans and Jews many times, including one time where he may actually have been raised from the dead. Paul's life, as well as the lives of everyone on, on his ship, was spared from death at sea through God's intervention. Paul also wrote to the Corinthians that the, that the signs of the apostle were wrought among them by himself. Yet there was no record of acts of any miracles performed by Paul during his visit to Corinth. Therefore, it can be concluded that there were many miraculous things accomplished by Paul that were not recorded just as in the case of our Lord Jesus. Ancient Illyricum occupied the territory that is modern-day Albania and Yugoslavia, just north of Macedonia, where Thessalonica and Berea were located. There is no record of Paul preaching in this area, so it can be supposed that he is referring to ministering up to the border of this province. Some people have interpreted Paul's statement, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, to mean that he had covered all the areas of Asia, Macedonia, and Ikea with the gospel. The following few verses would lend itself to that interpretation. However, the immediate context of this verse specifically mentions mighty signs, wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. This would lead us to believe that Paul, fully preaching the gospel, referred to the confirmation of the word through demonstration of God's miraculous power. Therefore, Paul could be making the distinction between just preaching the gospel and fully preaching the gospel. A minister hasn't fully preached the gospel unless they are accompanying signs and wonders. This must be where the phrase full gospel comes from. Okay, he was saying, and like the word says that, um, that when you preach the word of God, then signs and wonders are going to follow. Amen? It's a given. If you're preaching the gospel, signs and wonders will follow. In verse 20, it says, Yea, so I have uh, strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, it, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Paul had a burning desire to reach the unreached. The greatest legacy that Paul left us in his, in his epistles that were written to those he led to the Lord this reflected an attitude that Paul had that we should all, all have also. Paul didn't just evangelize, he discipled people. Amen. So we should all have that in our hearts to reach people uh, for Christ. And I think we all pretty much, you know, you can do that just around. I was talking to Billy and his wife up there that evangelizing, it's a special calling. And, you know, especially the, they went to the streets and, and ministered to people there. That's a special calling. And it, it takes a special kind of person to do those kind of works. But we're all called to do something, to preach and reach people. We can reach people in, in our homes, right, our family members and the people you work with. So, you know, you have your area of influence that you can reach for Christ. But that should be our desire in our heart, to be reaching people for the Lord. Amen. And verse 21 and 22, it says, But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and, that, and they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been, been much hindered from coming to you. Paul always had that desire to go to Rome. 
The cause that Paul is referring to is his desire to preach the gospel to everyone who had not heard. He had wanted to go to Rome, but he, but he felt it necessary to preach the gospel to everyone in areas he had already been first. This is what he refers to in the next verse when he says, not having normal places in these parts. He was saying there was no place left in those parts that hadn't heard the gospel. Therefore, he was ready to depart for new unre unpreached areas. In verse 13, it says, uh, 23, but now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you. He had a desire to go to Rome, but he saw a territory that hadn't heard the word of God and he, it, it was his great desire to go there and preach to those people. And he didn't want to go preach where somebody else had already preached. You know, he wanted to find someone that, you know, hadn't heard. Paul proposed in his spirit to visit Rome after he had gone back through Macedonia and Ikea. This happened while he was in Ephesus from 54 to 57 A.D. Paul was writing this epistle around 57 to 58 A.D. Therefore, Paul, many years, is referring to a two to three year period of time. Verse 24, Whos whensoever I make my journey to s into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward, thitherward <laughs> by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. Paul mentions his intentions to travel to Spain twice in this chapter, in this verse and in verse 28. These are only two times in scripture that this is mentioned. There is no scriptural account that Paul ever made it to Spain. Some have speculated that Paul went to Spain after his imprisonment in Rome. These are traditions that support but, not, but no fact. Paul is referring to Romans helping him with his expenses for his planned trip to Spain. Verse 25 and 26, But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it had pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia, thank you, to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are in Jerusalem. The account of Paul's travels in Acts do not give us any details about this collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. However, Paul does mention it as being the reason he made his last trip to Jerusalem. He, and he wrote about it in his letters to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 through 4, Paul gives instruction for the collection for the saints in Jerusalem. In verse 1, he says he gave the same instruction to the churches in Galatia. It is unclear whether he is saying he had also instructed the churches in Galatia to receive an offering for the Jerusalem saints, or whether he was simply instructing the Corinthians to receive the collection in the same manner as the Galatians received their offering. At any rate, Paul was only delivering the offerings from the churches of Macedonia and Achaia during the trip to Jerusalem. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 5, Paul spoke favorably about the attitude the churches of Macedonia, the churches of Thessalonica and Berea had towards this offering. He acknowledged that the churches of Achaia, the Corinthian church, had proposed to send an offering a year before the Macedonian churches. Paul gave the impression that the offering from the Macedonian churches was unsolicited. Paul encouraged the Corinthians to participate generously in this offering, offering reminding them that they would reap pr proportionally to the way they had sown. He stated clearly that they should not give under compulsion or try to give what they didn't have. 
And, they, and he gave them a tremendous promise of God's physical blessing on them if they participated. And you can find all that in Second Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. That's where it says, uh, be a cheerful giver. And um, give have you, have, as the Lord has proposed in your heart to give. This must have been a relatively large sum of money for Paul to be carrying to Jerusalem. Even though Paul could have demanded these people trust since he was the apostle that brought them the gospel, he made provision for whoever they chose to accompany him to Jerusalem to make sure the money went for what it was intended. This was a benevolence offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Verse 25, it had pleased them verily, and their de debtors they are. For if the Gentiles had been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Specifically, the carnal things Paul is referring to here is money. Verse 28 and 29, it says, When therefore I have performed this, I have sealed to them this fruit. I will come to you, I will come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of, of Christ. What a statement. Paul had no doubt that he would be walking in the fullness of God. This reveals that walking in the power of the Holy Spirit is a choice. Some people disagree and this with this and say you can't make blessings of God occur. They sometimes happen and other times they don't based on God's choosing. Otherwise, it would be like us being able to turn God on and off. The answer to, the, to that is God is always on. We are the ones that are on and off. Anytime we choose life, we can be assured that the life of God that was given us through, through Christ Jesus will flow. The responsibility rests on us to stir up the gifts that is in us. In verse 30, it says, Now I bese beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. This shows how important Paul thought prayer was. Paul begs these believers to earnestly intercede on his behalf. Verse 31 and 33. It says, That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul's prayer requested that he would be delivered from the religious unbelievers in Jerusalem. The answer to his prayer came in a way that many of us would not have liked. Instead of not having any problems, he was assaulted. And, and, wound, and wound, wound, wound up spending many years in prison. I thought I was saying wounded. He was wounded. <laughs> Yet he was delivered from the unbelieving Jews. They had tried to kill him three times, and it gives you all the scripture references there. But the Lord delivered him through the Roman, through the Roman government. Paul knew that trouble was waiting for him in Jerusalem. Paul said he didn't know exactly what would happen to him in Jerusalem, but he knew that it would be bonds and afflictions. And in Acts, he was prophesied to him, I think twice, that he should not go to Jerusalem because he was going to be tormented. I think that one of the scriptures says, one of the prophets bound his, his hands and his feet and said, this is going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. But he had a mission. He was going there to, to take that money. And um, it was awesome that these, these uh, in these places, Macedonia and the Corinthians, that 
Even the Macedonians, he didn't even request money for them, but they had in their heart to send to them. And he said that their fruit and that they would have blessing. You know, when you give unto the Lord, he's going to bless you back. You're blessed because you're a child of God. But when you give into his kingdom, you're going to be superbly, abundantly blessed. I believe that. I live that, so I know it's true. Amen. So God is good. So this is good. And, uh, of course, we'll talk about it in a minute. But <laughs> everybody's shy. Nobody wants to talk on, on camera. <laughs> but anyway, it's been good. And uh, we have one more chapter. So next Wednesday, we'll finish the class. Uh, we want to thank everybody that joined us online. We appreciate you being with us tonight, and uh, we're going to take up an offering tonight. If you want to uh, bring your tithes and offering, and if you're watching online and you want to give to this ministry, you could go to vclockhart.com and uh, go to the giving tab, follow the, the prompts, the give online, and you will get an uh, email, a receipt of your giving. Amen. And um, we'll be back here Wednesday, next Wednesday at 7, Sunday, regular service times, 9.30 English, 11 Spanish. Uh, we don't have, I think this Saturday, the men didn't decide to have a Christmas party. <laughs> so that's it. We'll dismiss you. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate you. We love you. God bless you. And have a lovely night. <laughs>